Cartoons were never for kids. Let's check this out, bro. Cartoons are not for children. I'll be the okay, judge of like that. 40 years, they were almost exclusively for kids, but they weren't originally created for them. Some of the most successful and iconic animations of the past 30 years were specifically designed for adults. And aside from a few iconic Disney creations, it's safe to say cartoons are more enjoyable when they are constructed for older audiences. Bro. Today, I'm going to take you all on a nostalgia trip, covering adult cartoons from their inception in the 1920s. Oh, shit. All the way to the crowning point of Adult Swim, the mecca of adult animations. Drink water. In the 1920s, Hollywood was booming, producing an average of 800 feature films per year. There were some cartoons, but they were still in early development. The few cartoons that were made in the 20s were shown at cinemas before a feature film. They were essentially short films with no dialogue, just music and sound effects. It was also in the 1920s where there was a big push for harsher censorship in films and theatrical performances. The Supreme Court ruled in 1915 that free speech did not extend into motion pictures. A lot of films, such as the ones performed Wait, at the New York stage, had mature content, nudity, cursing, oh, and adult shit. subject matter. It was like the Wild West with no rules and regulations. In 1927, it's, it's kinda, it was kind of like um Twitch when they when they allowed nudity for that one day. Everybody just started showing. And ass everywhere. There was a censorship committee formed by Will Hayes, a Republican politician, to propose some do's and don'ts in the film industry. It took a while for these suggestions to become an actual enforced code, known as Hayes Code. And in the meantime, cartoons would take advantage of the minimal regulations. Mmm. And so, was hentai was born. <laughs> was known as the pre-code era, Betty Boop. She was a caricature of the 1930s flapper, a woman with more love to give than knowledge to share, typically depicted as being innocent yet scandalous. She had a baby face, but the body of a grown woman. Many of these early Ooh. productions were heavily sexualizing Betty and other animated women. Some of these straight up glamorizing laws. Oh my God. Do you like your job? They pretty much depicted every way possible a woman's dress could get removed from her body. Betty exploded in popularity. However, with the enforcement of Hayes Code in 1934, the animation studio was required to button up Betty's image. What she is went this, from bro? being a free spirit flapper to a housewife slash career girl who wore fuller dresses. Her curls got straightened out, her earrings got smaller, and she slowly became more mature. She even turned a hoe into a housewife, Jack, and I get an amen. Different. Okay, we don't know how she smelled, but I think we can all agree smelling good is feeling good. By 1939, Betty Boop was over, but would be aired on television progressively throughout the next 60 years, stamping her in cartoon history. Mm. These codes seem to have uninspired animators to make cartoons for adults, because most of their humor at the time revolved around themes that were now banned by the code. So creators had to try and entertain the adult audiences inconspicuously through their children's shows. Mm. Animated shorts hit new strides in the 30s, with the creation of Mickey Mouse, Donald Duck and Snow White. These animations were good enough to captivate audiences for extended periods of time. Ooh. In the 40s, there was Bugs Bunny, Tom and Jerry, Bambi. They were definitely designed for children. But Yo, Tom and Jerry was the sh I don't care what any of y'all say. I could sit there and watch Tom and Jerry for like eight hours straight. Parents could watch and be entertained. Storylines were basic. Most of the humor came from silly faces, characters getting hurt, and just basic tropes that would make kids laugh. In 1949, the first animated television series was launched, called Crusader Rabbit. Gumby in the 50s was a groundbreaking Gumby. new animation style, but most of the 50s was dominated by the same kid-friendly animations from the 40s. Television sales were exploding in popularity, but animated series were not regularly programmed yet. You had experimental five-minute episodes programmed by oh. various stations at different times. Popeye being one of the more famous ones and was pretty much adult targeted leaning in Hold on one second, bro Isn't it crazy that we used to watch TV on these big ass bricks, bro fucking gigantic squares And now we just got these skinny ass thin ass TVs like what the f is going on it's kind of crazy when you think about it like chat think about it a tv bro a tv a dumbass kid would be like oh my god what's this a tv oh my and it could just kill that motherfucker, squash them like a roach you feel me but now now we got these little thin ass light ass tvs it's crazy into relatable humor the best kind that was a joke focused on the working class man and relating to his struggles 
Like, wow, the pipe broke on this sink. Oh my god, I hate when that happens. There was a massive shift in the 60s. The birth of Hanna-Barbera animations. Basically, every American household has a TV now. You had the Flintstones, the Jetsons, Pink Panther, Scooby-Doo, Spider-Man, Hulk, so many more. Regularly scheduled cartoons enjoyed by millions so you don't have to go to the cinema to see animation. There was more variety, better writing. Still leaning into the working class man and the modern family, but the colors were brighter, the scenes and animation were more imaginative. TVs in general were more creative and fun. Most of these cartoons were still family friendly, designed for children, yet really enjoyable for adults the to watch as well. The 70s was the birth of Nickelodeon, however, the mid 70s to mid 80s would be the weakest era for new cartoons. The 70s were carried by shows that were started in the 60s. Critics, whoever they are, say the golden age of animation ended in 1972. Obviously, everyone born in the 70s or later would say that's Cap, but many of the most critically acclaimed, financially successful, and culturally significant animated films and cartoons were released from the 20s to the early 70s. However, mm. they had significantly less variety and less competition, so it's a lot easier for those cartoons to have a bigger impact. These old cartoons were considered to be more lifelike, emotionally relatable, and contained valuable lessons. But a lot of adults may argue that cartoons are not a place where they want to learn life lessons and rather escape into a creative and complex alternate reality Rick and Morty, not to remind bro. them how much their boring life is just like this boring cartoon to no surprise cartoon ratings were plummeting resulting in budget cuts and then the release of low budget animations that didn't have a lasting impact the 1980s you had the birth of the disney channel Shows like The Smurfs, Thomas the Tank Engine, and Alvin and the Chipmunks. Dad, does anyone know about Papa Smurf? Let me lick your ass. Yeah, you can lick my ass, bitch. You know what I'm talking about? Papa Smurf, can I lick your ass? Yeah, you can lick my ass, bitch. Yeah? No. No, yes. No, no, yes. What the fuck? No. Okay, this is a generational thing then, bro. Okay, when the internet was very, very, very new, okay? The internet was new, it was viral. You know about it. If you're saying yes, I already know, bro. Hey, dap me up. Dap me up. Dap me up were hits for children, but the late 80s felt like cartoons were catering to their teenage and adult audiences a lot more. At this point, for almost 40 years, cartoons were perceived to be for children and almost exclusively designed for children. Like it started out exclusively for adults then immediately did a 180 for kids and was slowly building towards being designed for adults again. Teens were waking up in the morning, eating cereal, watching tunes, and chilling on the couch after school, watching tunes. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Transformers, He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. Bro, what is this music? Chill. Thundercats, Robocop. These were designed more so for teenagers and opened up a lot more opportunities for advanced animation, more action, and more advanced storylines that could be understood, not just haha -ha bonk on the head humor. There were a plethora of new shows being premiered only to be discontinued after a season or so. The scenes were more imaginative and immersive. Unfortunately, a lot of the shows didn't stick or become as culturally long-lasting as shows made in the 90s. But in 1989, something big happened. A cartoon written and designed for adults without being racist or overly sexual. The Simpsons. The Simpsons is not written for kids. It's written for adults. Mm. It was said by Matt Groening, who created the show. Matt was a visionary. He knew that the mainstream audience wanted and needed an adult-oriented cartoon show. Yeah, so y'all like The Simpsons, bro? He made it happen. Homer Simpson and Marge Simpson are married with three children, Bart, Lisa, and Maggie. They live in the middle America town of Springfield. It was an animated sitcom without the laugh track, leaning into a classic sitcom storyline, the average American family. Breakfast in the morning, conflict in the day, resolution at night. It was as basic as it gets in terms of understanding the general plot. Just watch the first episode and you have almost all the background information needed to watch the next 32 seasons. Although it was basic in nature, every episode was a new day and the creative possibilities were endless. Homer would overreact, get in ridiculous situations, and handle them how basically nobody would handle them. How about that rain check for the last night? Nah! 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 Don't look at me! Freak! <laughs> Don't you ever know? The animation style stood out from the rest immediately. They were all yellow, they all had extremely unique features like huge mouths and weird shaped heads. <laughs> the show was carried by the extensive array of wacky side characters all that have memorable characteristics and are voiced by unique and talented actors. The most successful primetime cartoon in history at this point. The Simpsons season what? 1 in 1990 averaged a whopping 27 million viewers per episode. No way, it was that good bro? Get the f*** 
out of here. I can't sit through an episode of this bullshit. I'm not going to lie to you. Since proved that a cartoon designed just for adults can not only be successful, but be the most successful. Uh, mm. Liquid Television. Produced by MTV and released in 1991, it was a compilation of animated shorts by independent artists. They were pushing the boundaries of animation, and all of it was catered oh, no. to adults. It was like this little secret network within a network that only a few knew about sounds familiar. This was the birth of Beavis and Butthead, which was a crude humored show about two dumbasses who couldn't do anything right. <laughs> we tricked him. <laughs> He's probably like, uh, there's nobody here. And we're obsessed <laughs> with the idea of getting laid. Ladies beware. <laughs> sure, it only lasted Ladies a few seasons, beware. but it is culturally <laughs> iconic. At the time, this was groundbreaking in terms of what comedy and adult cartoons could be. Primarily, children watch cartoons, but 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 adults watch cartoons too. In fact, in the evening, on the average evening, more people, more adults are tuned to the Cartoon Network than are tuned to CNN. That was Ted Turner, creator of the iconic Cartoon Network. Ted oh. was a visionary who knew how badly the world needed cartoons. His strategy started with buying the rights to every cartoon ever made. Sounds like an overstatement, what? but let me break it down. Ted founded CNN, the very first 24-hour news network in 1980. One year later, he purchased MGM Studios and United Artists for $1.5 billion, in which he sold a portion to cut down on the debt. He remained with MGM's pre-1986 library, which included thousands of Imagine films. just having $1.5 million just to throw somewhere, chat. Just imagine that. You know what I mean? Imagine it. That's old money, chat. That's old money right there. But more importantly, a ton of classic cartoons. Tight. Looney Tunes, Merry Melodies, Popeye, the list goes on. In 1991, he purchased almost all of Hanna-Barbera Productions' catalog, which included the Flintstones, Scooby-Doo, the Jetsons, and many, many more. Basically, Ted now owned the rights to every popular cartoon made in the last 60 years that wasn't made by Disney. And with that, Whoa. he started the first ever 24-hour network dedicated to strictly cartoons. He's so smart, though. The Cartoon Network did not explode in popularity right away. It was a bunch of reruns of old shows acting as a little nostalgia kick for older folks. This ultimately was a genius strategy because imagine Imagine trying to start a 24-hour network with zero shows that people knew. It would be impossible to get off the ground. So the network started with only old shows and got to work producing mm. originals. Just when you think TV is going to be taken over by all adult animations, we got another renaissance of children's cartoons on Nickelodeon. Doug, Rugrats, Ren and Stimpy, Rocco's Modern Life, Kablam, Rugrats, Bro, A Real Monsters, Hey Arnold. Nickelodeon hey was Arnold. the go-to place for children's cartoons. Even though some of these early cartoons were barely for kids. While Disney was producing the perfect imagination land where everything is happy and nice, Nickelodeon was bringing totally original animation styles, grim scenery, and taking creative risks. Cartoon Network slowed down on airing old shows in 1996, and they were ready to roll out their originals. Dexter's Laboratory, Johnny Bravo, Cow and Chicken, Ed, Ed and Eddie, Courage the Cowardly Dog. It's safe to say in the 90s, the line between what cartoons are for adults and what cartoons are for children is very blurry. It could mm. be because the censorship that was enforced in the 30s wasn't really challenged for 50 years or so when The Simpsons came out. I'm not saying that the 90s cartoons were edgy, but they were a little darker, more intrepid, more intense, and overall more adult. That episode scared me so much, bro. Anyone watch Curse the Cowardly Dog, bro? You know about this episode, I swear to God. Appealing. The 90s in general were a little darker and rebellious towards the 80s, where everything was seen as loud, colorful, and glamorous. Counterculture became cool. Grunge music and gangster rap became popular. Popular. So cartoons really blended in with the aesthetic of the culture. We are going to be different. So let's be cool and reserved and do exactly the opposite of what the 80s would do. South Park, 1997. South the first Park. episode was crass, in-your-face humor. Ike, you can't come to school with me. Go home, you little dildo. Dude. Don't call my brother a dildo. What's a dildo? This show was not for kids, which is funny because it's a bunch of fourth graders. At this point, The Simpsons proved you can make fun of pop culture, make fun of politics, make edgy, rude jokes while entertaining millions of people and creating a nine-figure worth show. South Park is not unique in its use of satirical humor, but it is one of the most effective satires due to its production format. The scripts for episodes are not written before the season begins, but the production of an episode begins on a Thursday with the creators, Matt Stone and Trey Parker, and the show's writers brainstorming ideas for the episode. The script will be written, animated, and voiced for release on Wednesday what? nights. Just six days of work. 
We work between 100 I would fucking you got me fucked up, bro. Hell no. Imagine working. That's worse than map a bitch. And 120 hours in a seven day week to deliver the episodes. This hectic production allows South Park to be in the zeitgeist of pop culture while it is happening. For example, in the season four episode Quintuplets 2000, the show nearly does a one to one recreation of a famous photo of a US border patrol raid during the Elian <laughs> Gonzalez affair, an event that occurred four days before the show aired. The season 7 episode, It's Christmas in Canada, references the discovery and capture of Saddam Hussein, which happened three days before the episode aired. Season Ah, so th that motherfucker got his boss on? Mmm. That makes sense, bro. That's why they're always on point with it. Mmm. 12's About Last Night revolves around Barack Obama's presidential victory, which happened less than 24 hours before the episode aired. Holy on shit. On the surface, the show appeals to almost any age group, but the news-like coverage of more serious current events events is certainly appealing to an adult audience. South Park has won five Primetime Emmy Awards as well as the prestigious Peabody Award, which honors excellence in storytelling that reflects the social issues and the emerging voices of our day. South Park remains one of Comedy Central's highest rated programs, and in 2021 was renewed through 2027. Two years after South Park came Family Guy, another soon-to-be iconic adult animated series, focused on a New England family, which was reminiscent of The Simpsons with a moronic father, stay-at-home wife, and of course, the three kids. The the first episode aired on Fox immediately after Super Bowl 33 to 22 million viewers. Season 1 maintained high viewership, but would dwindle through the second and third seasons. Following the third season's declining viewership, Fox decided to cancel the show in 2002. Hard to imagine a time where Family, Family Guy, Guy wasn't totally loved. Maybe it was just too similar to The Simpsons? This wasn't the end of the Griffins. There would be a savior coming to their rescue. Adult swing. The 2000s. A new century. This meant change. Changing back into kid-friendly cartoons? Again? Clifford. Nickelodeon started drifting from the grim, dark cartoons to more companionable and kid-friendly with the additions of Spongebob, Fairly Odd Parents, w The w Wild w Thornberries, Rocket Power, Jimmy Neutron. They still had Invaders in, Cat Catdog, and Danny Phantom. Disney Channel was even more kid-friendly. Cartoon Network was kind of the place where the cool teenagers indulge, mm. but it was spiraling down pretty fast. The don't network sleep on don't sleep on SpongeBob and motherfucking fairly yo chill out on bitch. I get real motherfucking stop it. Had a new CEO when the company was merged with Time Warner AOL. New ownership and new leadership will lead to changes. Ed All of their iconic shows like Dexter's Lab, Johnny Bravo, and Courage. <laughs> You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, you know what I'm talking about? You watch Dexter's Laboratory? Getting canceled. They rebranded, launched a few new shows that are beloved today, but weren't necessarily hits Man, at the time. It. Codename Kid Next Door, Billy and Mandy, Ooh, Foster's Home for Imaginary bangers. Friends. These shows were a little bit softer compared to previous Cartoon Network originals and were loved by children, but not teenagers and adults. So there was a gap You're in the market. You're bugging, bro. What are you talking about? It wasn't a go-to place where adults could escape into an animated universe and not have to worry about censorship and juvenile humor. Mm. Until 2001, with the birth of Adult Swim, Ooh. the very first animated network designed specifically for adults. The branding was clever, all kids out of the pool, because now it was time for the adults to have some fun without all the childishness. The shows often had a more mature Happy sentiment, months, coarse language. The Adult Swim programming block launched Thank just you. two nights a week, with one of those being just a repeat of the other. Original series would be aired such as Aqua Teen Hunger Force, The Brack Show, Space Goes like Coast you. to Coast, Sea Lab 2021, and more. Adult Swim kinda had a cheat code to launch the network. Since Ted Turner purchased the Hanna-Barbera catalog in the 90s, they were able to use classic cartoons such as Scooby-Doo and new shows like Harvey Birdman. This oh. may not seem like a big deal, but having the rights to a classic cartoon and being able to tell Collab, a new story bro. around those 50-year-old characters is a huge advantage to gaining new viewership. Imagine your dad flipping through the channels and seeing Yogi Bear on the witness stand. He would be confused, but interested to see one of his childhood cartoons be reimagined. True. Adult Swim could arguably get the credit for introducing Americans to anime, mm -hmm. broadcasting popular shows like Cowboy Bebop and Mobile Suit Gundam. By late 2002, the network was becoming more interested in obtaining the rights to animated series that had been cancelled. Again, knowing how hard it is to make new cartoons and get a new audience when you can just capture an already existing audience. One of the first and more notable of these was Futurama, which they obtained the rights to reruns for a reported $10 million. Jim Samples, Cartoon Network's executive VP said, Futurama reruns will take our Adult Swim programming to a whole different level. Adult Swim would come to the rescue for another show, which would become a pivotal moment for both
both the network and the series. Family Guy. Three seasons Family that had previously yeah. aired on Fox would now have a new home on Adult Swim. The president of Fox tried selling Family Guy, but nobody wanted it. We ended up giving them to Cartoon Network basically for free. In 2003, it became the block's top rated program. The Griffins boosted the viewership mad, of Adult bro. Swim and Cartoon Network as a whole by 239%. Holy the same shit. week Family Guy aired on Adult Swim, Fox released the first two seasons on DVD. 400,000 copies within a month were sold. The reruns and DVDs Holy were so successful shit. that Fox ordered 35 new episodes of Family Guy in 2004. Adult Swim officially brought the show back from the dead. With a massive increase in viewership, the Adult Swim block was expanded from two to five nights a week. Dang. Adult cartoons were about to take over. 2005 to 2015 would arguably be the peak of Adult Swim. Futurama and Family Guy were bringing in the consistent new viewers who were slowly and surely getting into the network's originals such as Venture Bros and Aqua Teen Hunger Force. Aqua Teen Hunger Force? I fuck with. I never really fuck with Venture Bros. I'm gonna be honest with you. Just look at them. I don't like their f faces. Get the f my face, dude. B ass. What's your bitch ass? I don't like them. But Aqua Team Hunger Force, what little meat wall right here? Oh my god, that's my favorite. Check this out. Oh yeah, baby. That's a new car she's washing. You think that's a straight six? I think I have a straight six. <laughs> Ooh, oh, your sexual innuendo is priceless. Iconic long running shows like Robot Chicken and the Boondocks mm. would be introduced. <laughs> I tried. Sorry, honey, sorry. I just got a crap like a bastard. I can't wait. Ah! Syndicated classics, <laughs> King of the Hill, and American Dad are running. Uh, not do. Yeah. Is it bad that I watched all the like I was young watching this? I didn't I, I had no business watching any of this shit, bro. You do this to me, puff puff. In 2007, they would expand their programming to seven nights a week, even branching out of animation with the Tim and Eric Awesome Show, the Eric Andre Show, Loader Squad. Although its popularity was at an all-time high, Adult Swim still felt like this dark corner of TV that only people with a secret password were allowed to watch. These were shows you escape into Ew, when you're get alone your toes out my face. with all the lights off, not with the whole family in the living room. You built relationships with the characters and became emotionally invested. If you were young, you didn't want your parents to find out what you True. were watching. Adult Swim gave up-and-coming creators a chance to display their animations to the masses. They embraced underground hip-hop and lo-fi, which at the time had very little representation. They were also known for their iconic bumps, which were 5 to 10 second segments after the show and before commercials. Also after the commercials and before the show. These bumps took away an extra commercial or two to provide a nice transition for the viewer. Most networks would just run another commercial for the bag. They were designed mm. to be relaxing, usually accompanied with a creative or funny visual and calm music. The black screen with white text became the most iconic bump style. In 2021, people were creating their own Adult Swim bumps on TikTok, and it was probably the best trend I've ever seen on that app. Bro, y'all did this for, um, for me, for, for our channel, dude. Adult Swim wasn't this roaring financial beast like Nickelodeon, or Disney Channel or even its host Cartoon Network, but they were creating culture and satisfying a market that was so desperately in need of something beyond Family Guy and The Simpsons. Cartoon Network had a second boom in the 2010s with Adventure Time, Regular Show, and The Amazing World of Gumball. While Disney That's and like Nick when I was heading out on Cartoon, I'm not gonna lie, chat. Like, I caught some of these, but like, they weren't like my childhood, you feel me? Hanging on for dear life. However, Adult Swim I was on my way out. with the introduction of Rick and Morty in 2013. Yes, Rick and Morty follows Rick Sanchez, a cynical mad scientist, and his timid grandson Morty. These two split their time between a complicated home life and interdimensional space travel. There aren't enough words to explain the imaginative- Who are you? Bitch, who are you, Josh? Fuck you looking at, you ugly big-headed bitch. Skedaddle, motherfucker. Ask me this dumbass question. Who are you? Who the fuck are you? Mm, I'll put my I'll put my little elephant trunk on your forehead. An insane plot lines in this show. It's been memed heavily in the mainstream audience definitely makes it seem a bit cringe, but it's a really great show even still to this day. Throughout its five seasons, Rick and Morty has measured an average viewership of 1.67 million viewers, which in the modern streaming era is excellent. Its influence around the world is immense, with multiple video games, tabletop games, memes, and music. But as you know, the way most of these videos end, the streaming era, the downfall Damn. of television and birth of social media leads to the rapid dwindling relevance of these networks. Half of the people watching this video don't have cable anymore or
or don't care to watch it. True. The others won't be purchasing HBO Max or any other streaming services to watch new or even old classic cartoons. Adult Swim, Cartoon Network, Disney Channel, Nick, they're doing fine. Times are different now. There are too many streaming services and too many social media platforms Dang. for cartoons or networks to have much cultural impact. Children's animations are definitely more financially successful and popular. Watching them later on in life is a heavy dose of innocence and youthfulness. But the longevity and day-to-day -day value that adult cartoons bring is unmatched. No matter where you decide to watch them, whether they are old or new, adult cartoons are and always will be the superior animations. I'm gonna be honest, there's so many we got we i gotta pay like 20 not even 20 dude probably like 57 dollars for all the motherfucking things i need bro who oh shit i'm dying holy shit hulu motherfucking uh netflix motherfucking um uh, hbo max motherfucking paramount motherfucking disney plus what else bro Net, did i already say netflix netflix times two because i gotta get two motherfucking shit because my goddamn gotta pay for some other shit because we can't account share and shit no more